Hello and welcome to a new episode of No Prize Podcast. I am the Professor Bud Young, and with me, recovering from his night of debauchery, is Lucas. How are you, Lucas? Recovering, man. I'm still still going. Still in the middle of his night of debauchery. (laughs) I tell you what, Costco made a mistake. They just put all the alcohol just right out there in front, so I just had to grab all the normal (laughs) cases. Sorry, Costco. Sorry. So, man, it's been great, man. How, how how have you been doing, Professor? I'm doing good, you know. I mean, uh, kind of catching up on a lot of different Marvel stuff going on. They keep uh, they keep pushing back a lot of a lot of stuff, but uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that there's been a lot of interesting news, right? So they uh, they're kind of in the middle of trying to decide what they're trying to do with Black Widow. Um, there was rumors that it might go the way of uh, Winter Woman 1984, where they might just release it, but they still haven't positively said that's happening because Wonder Woman 1984, they decided was going to get streamed on um, somewhere, whether it be HBO Max or whatever. HBO but Max. Still, yeah. yeah, but they still haven't decided what they're going to do with Black Widow. Um, so they should definitely just go ahead and do it, right? Because right now, even though they're, everybody's coming out with all these, you know, these centers and everything. Hey, let's go back to the theaters. No, no, I've seen the way you're, you're those sixteen year olds clean the theaters. I don't trust them. Um, <laughs> go, go, just go ahead. If we can release it, I will give you the thirty dollars. If you want to re- go ahead and put it up to fifty dollars, go ahead and put it up to fifty dollars. I will pay that. Just so I can sit home in my pajamas and we can watch it all on movies. Yep. Um, well, you got to think. I mean, you go to the movies. You're generally not going by yourself. You're going with two or three people, and it's a it's a fifty dollar night out once you've paid for popcorn and drinks. So you yeah. want to put fifty bucks up there, and then that way the the movie studio is getting the majority of that ticket price, right? Not the concessions. So I think that I think it might be a wash. But uh, yeah, I, I I totally agree with you. Um, but it looks like we got a, a a release date for WandaVision, right? It's January fifteenth. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I cannot wait for that. And it's not just because of the WandaVision or the Wanda and the Vision character. It's all the underlying characters that bringing them into the MCU or whatever um, kind of portents because they've got so many characters attached to them from the family of Vision to the stuff that Wanda is. You know, she's a mutant unto herself. Mm-hmm. Um, so that could mean that they could be bringing in the mutants through that portal. And there's also, we already know that Monica Rambeau, who is a Captain Marvel, um, she's already going to show up because she's already showed up in some of the trailers. So I cannot wait for that to come out. That's and that that's one of the things I think um, is going to be interesting, um, especially uh, and I'm, not to touch on well, not to touch on Star Wars for a minute. But if you if you were watching The Mandalorian and you watched last week's episode, it all all of a sudden made Clone Wars and Rebels required watching. If you haven't watched it, but the, so like the one thing that I think about what they're going to do with Disney with Marvel is you're going to see all these TV shows are going to tie into the MCU. Uh, at some point about and but there might be crucial things in there so they i would i would consider them required watching if you're a fan of the mcu yeah but, i mean i've already seen you know um aliens and i think predator might have been bought out by the disney joint right so or at least they're they're going to work on a closer relationship yeah. you know and i've already seen um elements of that for instance in one of the last one of, was it one of the last two uh Mandalorians, I've already seen that little egg, that little alien egg. I've already seen that in there. Oh, um, really? The way it, if you can open, yeah, the way it, if it opens up, that's definitely the oh, alien right. egg. Right. So, so I, I think that's amazing that they're trying to do that, and I hope they do that because you know the Aliens franchise is kind of broken right now. It's not really exciting. They explain too much without it actually making sense. So, um, whereas I would have said, ooh, Disney evil empire now i'm going like you know what go ahead disney take take that stuff and fix it please you know yeah that's no, good well let's let's jump into uh what we got going on with marvel comics this week uh they we have some some good releases and you know some bad ones but we'll get into uh uh let's get into the indigenous voices book because i think that that's pretty important um given given what marvel has wanted to do over the last several years and create uh or um promote diversity in their books and this is not the first i think indigenous voices that we got right didn't we got we got a black creator um book 
about three or four months ago, right? Yeah, something like that. I didn't really read it, or if I did, I don't really remember it. Um, so once again, once I, before I was talking about, ooh, you know, evil empire, how dare they, you know, freaking cater to the masses or cater to whatever, you know, in this book, it actually hit different, right? Because they didn't just do the normal whitewashing. Oh, hey, here's these, these, uh, these Native American characters. They actually went after some actual issues, right? In, a, in an interesting way. They didn't whitewash like, hey, these guys are always innocent. They're angels. They say, hey, they knew what they had to do, and they actually, this is what they actually tried to do, and, and it kind of hit different. Uh, so, so this is the first one that I'm tracking of. There's a point which covers. For the Vragey Indigenous Voices, but Marvel Voices, Indigenous Voices, number one. Um, they've got a, diff a lot of different stories in here that were actually pretty good. Um, between The Watcher, uh, which was uh, written and drawn by Jeffrey Vragey, he drew some absolute, absolute beautiful covers. I will let's, I'm trying to see if there's any posters, by because I would love to have it in my background. Um, Echo Hitting Back. Uh, written by Rebecca Roanhorse, drawn by Wishoid Avaturi, colored by Lee Ruffridge. Uh, the Mirage story was uh, multifaceted, written by Darcy Little Badger, drawn by Kyle Charles, colored by Felipe Sorrero. Silver Fox Blue Moon, written by Steffi, Ste St excuse me, Steph Stephen Graham Jones, um, inked by Roberto Poggi, colored by Chris Peter. And uh, there's an afterword that's in there, written by Taboo and B. Earl. Um, once again, I can't tell you how much I appreciated this freaking story, right? And, and it's interesting, the timing of it, right? Because we do have – we're right in the middle in between the Christopher Christopher Columbus holiday, which is dubbed by some the indigenous um, day here in America. And then, we, yeah. Yeah. and then next week is Thanksgiving which in in historical mythology is dated when the pilgrims and the the native americans got together and they helped them out but we know that not all of that was necessarily true um but we do know something happened which birthed the, the country that we have today so there's all types of different stuff in here um and i'm not going to go through every single story because by going over the story my way, I will actually spoil it. However, I can tell you that there are quite a few new characters in there. Um, and each character, the way they are displayed in here and that they, they kind of reveal their Native Americanness and how they use their, their cultural to go forward every day. It was so interesting and so beautiful, right? Um, there's... There's even the uh, there's a couple of panels where the watcher and he's explaining the connections in between all of these Native American. He's explaining what uh, what tribe they come from, what powers they have, and how that affects their freaking powers and the way they go for it. That was that was a freaking beautiful thing. Even and it's a nice uh, splash panel, not just splash panel, beautiful freaking panel by much panels uh, by Varege. Um, I can't say enough about this. Um, and then there's the there's the story. I forget which story it is, in which um, they're they're uh, it's it's like in olden days where you know the they're pilgrims and everything, and they're just they're just trying to sit up. They're just trying to survive the winter. And I forget the names of the characters. They say, no, 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 we can't let this happen because you know once they freaking get a hold on this land, they're going to. So how about we do this? How about we just kind of sabotage? Um, their survival stuff, and then everybody will think, hey, they just died of norm normal causes because they couldn't survive. Um, and the, pro the thing is, as one of them has the ability to see it in the future, he can see everything that they're going to do as a result of what they're going to do. Oh, yeah, they're going to freaking end up eating themselves. All right, good, good to go. So they're, so they're not saying, hey, these guys are angels, but they are, there's a reason of what, there's a reason behind what they what they did, and I really appreciated that because let's not pretend that all indigenous peoples are angels. Everybody suffers when there's an invasion, but let's not pretend there's angels and this and the desperation that they went through um, just to try and freaking <laughs> get some piece of land for themselves. I thought I thought that was beautiful, and and, and I love that freaking piece. Um, I can't say that the uh, 
the name of the new character that's in there. He is, his name is like Julian De Leon. Um, he's an interesting character because he's not just uh, I've got this mutant superpowers. He can bring out stuff from different dimensions. You gotta understand how powerful that is. He he just doesn't oh well. No, let me go ahead and freaking summon bats and everything. Oh, let me summon these freaking monsters from another freaking dimension. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, these these tentacles that just come out of nowhere. Um, and he and he's a young kid. He's what maybe 15, 16 or something like that. Um, it is it's interesting, and I'm I, I want to see more of this character. I hope they I hope this is the last that we see of that character, and I hope this is just a jumping off. And I and what's interesting is that the speculator community they're not even tracking this right now. I didn't even get a chance to talk about this uh, last night with some of the speculation guys. Um, so nobody's tracking that there's a new guy and he's that normal all powerful. So if you see that, go ahead and take that, buy that, and then just, just set it aside for right now. Um, what about you, Professor? What did you What did you think? Um, well, yeah, first of all, I do want to shout out that first double-page spread from Jeffrey Varegi about the um, – with the uh, all of the uh, Native American characters and the first couple of uh, pages, what sh what shocked me about well about this issue because I it, I didn't say I'm going to say this issue is more about the creators than it was the the actual characters in the story um, because that's what we're shining a light on right this indigenous voices yeah the the characters are all Native American characters but the creators were all uh, were all Native American as well so that to me was probably more important uh, to the industry as a whole than um, than the actual stories in the book. Now, when we get to the stories in the book, I think largely they're hit or miss. The um, the first one, which uh, the first two-pager with the, with the Watcher, very stylish, very, uh, very Native American. Uh, Jeffrey Vrigia, Native American artist that, you know, it just made you uh, think of the, you know, totems and, and the, the you know, the language of, uh, of all the different Indian peoples. And to me, I thought that was really the most striking part of the book. The thing that surprised me is actually how many uh, uh, Indian characters that there are in Marvel. Uh, oh, oh, you think there would be more over the last sixty years, right? But it, you know, the when they kept going to d different characters, and I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that guy, Black Crow. I knew I knew about Black Crow, but I never, you know, never really read a story about him. I think I re did read one in Marvel Comics Presents a bazillion years ago. But um, the the focus on the stories, the three stories in here, Echo. Mirage and Silver Fox, which surprisingly, this is this is the first solo Silver Fox story we've ever gotten. <laughs> you know, usually everybody remembers Silver Fox as the the Wolverine's uh, lover that Sabretooth killed, right? right? Yeah, and that's all anybody really remembers her as. Everybody knew she was Native American, but I didn't know. Um, you know, it's not. I don't think it's her in the story that's actually the the, the mutant character. I think it's a different. Indian, but um, that story was actually that was the one that you're talking about with the uh, the looking into the future and seeing what's going to oh. happen. That was that was uh, actually a, a really decent story. I think that one was the best one out of the entire book. Um, but uh, just to just to get some backstory on Silver Fox and to see um, what she was all about, because really, kind of the only remembering i have from her is she was a victim <laughs> you know <laughs> so seeing seeing uh seeing something different was was really good uh on that end uh the mirage story was your typical mutant story that's the uh you know hey the new mutants found it find a new mutant and um that that was kind of a paint by number story and that was the one you're talking about that introduced the new character um going forward that i'm af i'm afraid we might not see this character again because we've yeah. seen this so many times you know they could they they find a mutant and and then we, nobody ever does anything about it um, they get they get shipped off to some ship off in the middle of the ocean and then we never hear <laughs> from them again it's like all right send like, them to doing Send him to Krakoa, and we'll just see him as part of a background scene. <laughs> exactly. You know, freaking, I, I, I harken back to Wolverine last year. He had this new daughter, this blonde daughter, who was part yep. rich, part freaking Wolverine. And we have not heard from her in forever. Yep. And speculators were going hard on her. That was like a $100 book. We have not heard from her since like the, 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 the third or fourth issue. And then that was it. Yep. 
Yeah. No, and you know we, what? I we, don't know. I don't know if we will. You know, that's one of my my. We could talk about the, my problems with the current Marvel for for days if we want to. That's one of them. Is that uh, you know everything's written for the trade, and by the time you start the next story, you forgot what happened before, and <laughs> you never ever reference it again. Um, the, there's very few Marvel writers out there that uh, that will that will carry on what has happened before instead of ignoring it. And um, yeah, I think uh, we if we see anything about that character, maybe it's two or three or four years down the road when everybody's forgotten about her. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh yeah. Like, oh come on. Guys. And now and and then at that point, everybody's searching for her first appearance, right? <laughs> exactly. Everybody's unsold it. It's it's in somebody's back, man. It's all crunched up. Nobody cares about it anymore, and it's done. Yeah, and then and then then some some Yahoo like me was like, hey, yeah, remember back when? And then all of a sudden, everybody's scrambling for it. Yep, yeah. that's I I I feel like that's what's going to happen because I think I think there are not a lot of people crying out for uh, another like another Wolverine relative to come through the you know the woodwork. Yeah, and and the interesting thing was we had um when she came out and somebody had asked us, well, what do you think of her? You know being a big thing like is she going to be big like big big like is she going to be like a movie or anything and i was like hold up so we actually counted how many children does logan have and this is in like the freaking hundreds and we're like well and they were like well how many of them have had, had their own titles and there was like well there's been at least 16 you know <laughs> 16 that have had their own title um and and then from whether it be like natural kid kids that he like actually stuck with somebody or that he's been like the clone of a clone of a clone and he's had quite a few and in fact that year when she came out there was another one that was a clone that was a kid of his that was a clone of him and hulk uh weapon h yeah people have forgotten about that already oh yeah yeah when i you had to say weapon h for me to remember that <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like it, it, it's it's ridiculous, and and what's even interesting is is that while he was coming out, they, while they were coming out with him, DC had has another one that's almost just like that, where he's got almost the same powers except for like the claws and everything. Um, it's uh, I don't know if you remember Damage, um, yep. where he's where he's. He's got the whole powers and he's got the ability to recuperate and all that other stuff. Damage it, and they they've already gotten rid of damage already. You know, so um, so I appreciate them trying to come up with new stuff, and, with new ideas, but you no know, follow through. Stop teasing me like that. You no, know? yeah, <laughs> that's a, that is another part that I uh, another problem I have with Marvel is they don't give they don't give uh, books time enough to find an audience so <laughs> you know well we could talk about that like i said we could talk about that all day but um so what did uh, bottom line indigenous voices a flame on for you absolutely it's uh it's not only just a flame on it was a pick this book up mm -hmm. store it away just in case um and and this is i wouldn't mind if you know people this is a book that i even see i could even see teachers saying well, I wanted the kids to learn something. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and give this book to the kids, um, and it's, it'll be entertaining as well as educational in some some aspects. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a flame on for cultural uh, relevance at the time, and I, I also think, you know, the, that to to give um, indigenous voices, indigenous creators voices, right, instead of just the characters. Um, that you know could mean a lot going forward. I just hope that this is not a one-off for a lot of these writers and artists. You know that they can just say, "Hey, I had my stuff published in a Marvel comic book once. Give them a chance and let them see what you know. Maybe we can get some originality and uh, and creativity coming out of uh, some of the people that that might be getting heard for the first time here." So. Right. Um, so that is what I'm interested in, and that's where why I think you should pick this book up because I think it's important. I, uh, you know, you you cannot like you know maybe you don't like the characters in it, but I think that, like I said, for cultural ref, uh, relevance, this is a this is a must buy. Yes. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Let's uh, okay, let's um let's talk X of Swords. Um, and we had three chapters this week come out. Um. 
we had Cable, we had Hellions, and we had X Force. Um, I'm going to, well, you know, kind of let's keep Cable up there and talk about that because that's part, that's chapter 19. So um, the storyline pushes through uh, all three of these books. The only one that's a little different is Hellions, where you have like the, um, uh, what do we want to say? It? The, they call the like the Black Ops team, yeah, <laughs> or something. The 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 team with the characters no one really cares about, um, led by Mister Sinister, uh, and that's the only really side kind of almost like a side quest on this. Um, but I'm I I feel like we should talk about X of Swords overall as a story as opposed to the individual chapters, um, because honestly. The, the trade dress of the, the title of the book really has no relevance over what we're actually reading about, even though Cable's actually in the Cable book. But the X-Force book is just a straight-up continuation of the story. None of the characters from the X-Force are actually in, in that book. But um, So I, I know we have a, a lot of different uh, creators on this book, but... Uh, the most, the person I want to probably most blame for this is, uh, is <laughs> Jonathan Hickman. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know that's probably the worst, the worst word I could use. Um, I can't tell you how mad I am about this crossover because I feel like I have been taken advantage of for my um, how much are these books? Three ninety nine or four ninety nine a piece? Yeah. Mm-hmm for yeah. how many chapters are in this 22 so do the math guys right so 22 times you know whatever uh that was four just like 88 bucks yeah well Plus it, tax. In, in the in the in the three chapters right the, the beginning and the end and then the middle chapter is like 7.99 books a piece right and this was built up and we could talk with just what we were talking about a month ago when this just started, right. Was we had uh, all of them going on a quest, different 10 different swords that were going to allow them to compete in this tournament of, you know, what, was it, what I would call like mortal combat. I was, I was comparing it to video games, right? Like it's going to be like, uh, you know, this round one fight, you know, and then, um, over the, this month, and these the, the and you can see it in the in the cable chapter, right? The 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 swords are are not even being used in a majority of these contests. Yes. Which, you know, I was thinking that this was going to be like like a battle, like battle, 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 battle. So I, I kind of thought it was going to be boring anyway. But I thought that they might try to shoehorn some story, but they haven't. They, you know, the the the. They they've gone from from having sword fights to having one of the contests was Cipher actually marrying his opponent. Mm-hmm. That was that was the challenge. That, that was, was challenge. it. That yeah. was it. Hey 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 hey! Everybody's marriage ain't making happy. Some of them are challenges unto themselves, man. Right. <laughs> and so, and then there's a there's another one that was um, a dance contest. Yeah. What? There was, there was, don't, don't forget there was my my, my favorite challenge, the drinking contest. Yeah, there was the drinking contest. And between there Wolverine was, and Storm, which was weird because yeah, I, 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 I didn't get that one. So anyway, yeah. So yes, yes, there were a couple of them that were your classic uh, good guy versus bad guy fight. And they didn't really end kind of the way you'd think. Every time Wolverine fights someone, it's uh, it, it kind of ends badly for Wolverine. And they do kind of throughout the chapters like, wow, man, we have the deck stacked against us. Saturnine's working against us and wants us to lose, right? So I'm sitting there going, okay, I'll buy into this. Saturnine is really kind of setting the X-Men up for, for failure here. And, you know, by the time we get into Cable, the score is like 18 to 6 or something stupid like that, right? And I'm just like... I, I have totally checked out, right? At, by the time we hit this book, Cable number six, which is chapter 19 of 22. So we only have a couple of chapters left before we get to the big uh, climactic chapter. I'm already checked out. I'm already like, okay, it's 19 to six. Uh, we can, I can tell where the story's going. Um, wrap it up already, right? Um, 
uh, the the thing the other things I'm really pissed about is we spend so much time learning about other world. Let's read some texts about the 13 different worlds that are surrounding the citadel and all of the different populations and who runs what and who's in charge and where they're going to be and what swords are they have and what the powers of the swords are and who's ha who has the swords and the tarot cards and the whole idea of the setup and it's been sh shit then we we've got maybe they're uh, they're in one world. They're in the citadel. The, none of these other worlds are coming into play. None of the explanations. None of this text that you've read at all that I thought was going to be super important. So many details. Everything coming at you like they were rapid firing you the first 10, 10 chapters. Like read the text. What did I say the last podcast? You have to read the text. It's going to be really important. It's right. not. It's not important. The swords aren't even important. You know the swords, the the swords that they've they spent the first ten chapters gathering before they ever actually had the the dinner. <laughs> they had yeah, they yeah. had dinner. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, before they before they yeah went that, was, that was last week, right? When they had the dinner, right? Yeah, yeah. That but I mean, last week. Oh god. But but I, that that first part, that first month where they were like, you know, they'd have Wolverine or Psylocke or Captain Britain getting the sword, and then they join the circle, and it was all like, I, I was I was hearing all the the Mario Brother music, like dun da da da. By the time you get to the next <laughs> chapter, and I'm like, okay, so they're gonna get it, and then they're gonna get to the ten people, and then they're gonna go fight. So you know and now that they're fighting it's it's so it's so dumb it's it's dumb and the the this last uh, you know uh, just given it to talk about cable so cable's a big chapter and he fights his opponent and loses badly to make it 18 to 6 or whatever it was but then the the final chapter the fi like one of the final battles to 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 the, who's the big hero of the issue to to even up the score is fucking Gorgon. The this guy who has uh, very very few appearances in a Wolverine book. It's a Wolverine bad guy, and his ability is he to, he could turn people into stone, but he's also kind of like a samurai kind of guy, right? Right. So his he he goes up against his guy, and his guy says you have to fight a hundred of my men before you, you fight, fight me. me right so gorgon's like bring it and he takes out like 19 of this of of 19 bad guys oh but he get you know what he gets a point for every guy he kills so exactly. now it's tied up All right no no he he they went they went a point up they yeah he went yeah, a point up right, like, right. what so i'm sitting there going okay I, i'm just shaking my head Right. Because I'm just like, you can't have, you know, why can't you have Wolverine be that guy? You know, he's your X man. He's, he's your mutant. He's, he's the, he's the people like spending the money to read about Wolverine. You put Gorgon in there as the, the, the man he's, he, and, and of course then he gets, he gets whacked. Right. So <laughs> you're just like, okay. You know, and the, so, so story things to, to, to think about in this so uh one of the biggest problems i think that we've had in this in this mutant x-men fiasco is the the bringing back of people like the resurrecting so death doesn't mean anything anymore except on other world <laughs> yeah they so, haven't explained that yet there there's no explanation yet like okay so so far they've killed the summoner which yeah. was supposed to be a big character they've killed captain britain yeah and they, they literally like shattered her freaking world. She's destroyed, done, and everything. Uh, you can't just do that, man. <laughs> you can't just freaking kill off these freaking people. Um, yeah, and they're not. You know, I'm sure that there's know, gonna oh, be geez. a reason. Like, they're gonna come back. You know, and it's just like, I just don't know. The, like, the wheels on this crossover have just come off the bus so badly, and I, I just, I think. Uh, is the when I, the more I'm reading it, I'm just like, is this what Hickman wanted? Did Hickman want to blow up the mutant universe? Like, he he spent so much time setting this up 
Um, and then this was almost like a microcosm, this whole crossover, the X of Swords, where there was so much text and things to, to, to learn about. It was almost like the minor leagues of his powers of X and, uh, and everything from a couple of years ago, where there was so much text and so much, so much world building that yeah. you had to read, you had to catch up on it so that you understood everything. This was kind of like the, the, the smaller version of that, but there was still so much to read, but then he didn't do anything with any of it. You know, and and yeah. who knows? There is two chapters left, right? So maybe he'll explain why they actually needed the swords, or why we actually needed to know about all this other other world stuff. Um, but to me, I cannot clobber this harsh, harsh, harder enough. The you would spend if you spent as much time reading these nineteen chapters plus the texts that I have, I would you would be. Uh, it's it's a time sink. It's not worth it. And s s spend your what eighty something dollars? Is that what it is? Yeah, eighty eight dollars, and that's not including any money that you might have spent on the variants. <sighs> um, and and that's and even that would have been fine with me, except for every once in a while they had these surprise variants that come out, which means yeah. that if you if you were thinking that you were going to buy a variant, and make some money off of that. Nope. Nobody cares about that because there's a, a one per store or the the retailer variants. Um, so how, so how do so how do I how do I unwind my feelings about this? <laughs> oh yeah, please take over from me. <laughs> I'm going to try and be as short and concise as possible. Um, I so the. So, so let me recap the way the way I thought this was going to go down, right? No, there is the the whole middle of this thing is the citadel, and the citadel is supposed to be portals to other worlds, right? There's about ten or eleven other different worlds. Whoever has control of the citadel is determined by this particular battle. The one of the lords of the other worlds, he has this thing where he can come back. But before he comes back, he always wants to make sure that the swords, like all these different powerful elements and freaking objects are in one place so that they can't just surprise him and then kill him with it. And I forget the name of the book where I read that. Um, it was like the witch, it was like a whole book about, it was like a mini series about witches and everything during the 80s. Um, but that's what ha went down. That's why the whole Egyptian mythology thing was kind of interesting. Um, in fact, uh, Storm's ancestor, she had a big part of that. She was the one that find, found one of the swords, the sword that's used by the dog dude. Um, that's where that came out of. So I think this, I think this whole battle is more like a, a, a subtext freaking, uh, hidden thing. Whereas, Hey, you guys are occupied doing this battle, but the, the big guy that's coming out, he's, he's. He just wants you guys to have all this stuff in one place so he can eventually destroy all you guys and he'll be back. In fact, he actually showed up. He showed up a couple of times. Um, it's just that people don't know that he's a pretty big freaking guy. Um, in the meantime, I've also seen elements of the character from the One Beyond All. That's uh, that's the whole character. He's so, kind of slowly creeping in. There's the, uh, the Null character. I've seen elements of that... He may be able to come make his way back through the portals, um, through extra swords. But when I see these last three issues that came out this week, I'm like, wait, what? What are we doing? You you just t took all that good work of building that, and all of a sudden you threw it out the threw it out the window, like you like you said. You know what this this these uh, reminded me of particularly the the Hellions was it the Hellions? No, it was the X Force book. You know what this reminded me of? You know, like whenever the, some of the characters they go to Mojo World, and they freaking compete in some of those games. That's what this is reminding me of so far. Whereas, like, hey, well, let's let's play a whole bunch of games, and nothing none of this matters, even though people have died, and they're supposed to not be able to come back. It's kind of what reminds. It's so silly, mm -hmm. without any type of goal or objective or a thing that's going to pin me down to like, oh yeah, this is the greatest book of all time. Um. And I don't know, I don't know whether my initial feelings toward the direction they were going were correct, or whether I just played myself, and all of a sudden they're just gonna try to make this silly because it was getting too too dark. Um, 
I hope they fix it. I hope there's a, a greater plan at work here. Um, but we, we shall see. So uh, it's not an invisible woman. It's not a flame on. It's like, what the heck is going on? Please explain it quick, because you you took you did a you you were good. They were doing really good, and then all of a sudden, this whole week was just so bizarre and so crazy. Um, except for maybe the parts of the cable book where no, because uh, he lost the battle, right? And it was supposed to be a battle to the death, and that's what kills me. It was supposed to be a battle to the death. And he lost the battle. But then all of a sudden, Saturn steps in, steps in. She's like, oh, it's supposed to be a battle, uh, a battle to the death. But sometimes death is death of the spirit. Uh, all what? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Now. Yeah. I that's I was like, what a what a cop out. What a jip. But, not, you know, but what are they going to do? Kill off the main character of the book? That's, I mean. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's, we got could, could, he's, got, he's got different versions running around. Yeah, they could kill off young Cable and bring back old Cable. Uh, 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 old Cable is actually running around in the book. You haven't seen him since issue two, but you know, who knows? Copped out, copped out, copped out. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's uh, let's take a quick break, and uh, we will be right back. And we're back, and we're jumping into Marvel Snapshots Avengers now. So Marvel's uh, Marvel Snapshots has been uh, a book that that's been coming out for what the last four, five, six months. But they've been dropping and that they've been dropping as one shots, and they, each snapshot focuses on a different character and the Marvel universe. But the the premises to the book are all the same. If if you read Marvels twenty five years ago uh, by Alex Ross and Kurt Busiek, which was I think the um, that's this is that's the bar that uh, that that is set for all of these books. So right off the bat, you're you're setting the bar that's unattainable, right? Because who's gonna beat the original Busiek? and Ross not going to happen. Right. Good. So you kind of have to lower your expectations a little bit and see if you can find some enjoyment in the story that comes out. The premise really is uh, the heroes in the story are really just backdrop, right? They're really just happening in the background and we have to learn, we have to meet these new characters who are just regular people trying to live in the this society where people are super and um, and just trying to survive, really. That's kind of what it comes down to, especially when you live in New York City. It's kind of like going through 9-11 every day, exactly. right? So um, so we have uh, Barbara Randall Kessel and Staz Johnson putting together um, this Avengers uh, one-shot where uh, the backdrop is actually Avengers number 198, uh, from the beginning of the story, which is um, which is when Red Ronin, a samurai robot, like kind of like a uh, kind of like a gay king. If you remember, do you remember those uh, those big uh, future like mech droids from the seventies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, so so yeah. Red Ronin was one of those one of those big uh, robot dudes. Ah, uh, uh, okay. That and he and he he was attacking the city and I think I'm trying to think of who the big bad was in that issue whether it was like a yellow claw or something something really racist and anyway it was it was um the 
uh, so it was right before issue 200. So it was like what, 1978, 79. And, um, and if you, if you look back, cause I actually had to look, cause I was, when I was reading this book, I was like, this is an actual bad guy from an actual story. And I had to find, like, I had to go back and find out what it was. And it was definitely, it was Avengers number 198, the Red Ronin story. And it's the same lineup that's in the book that's in, that was in that book too. Captain America, Iron Man, Vision, Scarlet Witch, The Beast, Wonder Man. You know, this is my favorite lineup of all time as far as Avengers go. But like I said, they're, they're really kind of in the background in this story. And the main characters you get are uh, this uh triage nurse i I don't even remember the names i don't know if we're supposed to um (laughs) so triage nurse and then there was a cop right um that it was kind of like uh the story is basically uh people connecting during a crisis right yeah and um i actually thought the story was decent as far as getting uh, getting to know these characters i kind of i don't know if the um the flow of the story worked very much because you were having, first of all, it's a kind of a like a flashback story anyway, because it is set in the late seventies, early eighties. But problems that I have with these books are timeline problems because I bought this book, got this book in 1978. And now, you know, she's wearing f- like flash dance leggings from the 80s. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what I didn't get. And, man. Like, <laughs> you know, like what what year is this supposed to be? And that's that, you know, I don't know if newer readers will have that issue because it's just going to look like the past for everybody. Right. Uh, but for older readers like myself and you, uh, you know, that's where I'm just like, okay, is this happening in 1986? Is this happening in 1979? Is this happening? Like, who knows? Because then she's also talking about, I think the very first panel was, when do I get my CRISPR back to myself? And I'm like, that's, (laughs) wait, that's kind of a newer appliance. (laughs) Is that, is this happening in the 2000s? So I don't know. It's uh, th- those are the, but those are like minor problems. I think, um, I think uh, the the biggest issue that this has is so Staz Johnson as the penciler. Um, it's kind of a bit his, his it, the work's a bit erratic. Uh, I know he's trying to he's he's kind of saddled with having to draw, uh, you know, buildings collapsing and you know, kind of disaster scenes in every panel, um, but when you're looking at these snapshots books and, and you're like, you're, like I said, you're measuring yourself against Alex Ross. Um, that's, I, I kind of feel like that this, that the art was maybe a little bit of a miss here for me. Um, the story, a little, you know, uh, it's a, it is a kind of a little convoluted kind of have like this established this kind of a love story. Uh, the, the gimmick ending where uh, through, through, flashbacks you find that the that the cop character had had a run-in with tony stark and got like a uh, like a free pass to save someone um in the like in the future because that's that's i guess the the cops it's actually paid me a good a, a good uh a good point is how the first responders feel about the superheroes when they realize you know the superheroes are are so busy trying to save the city but if they took two minutes to see what was going on underneath them and to try to save the people that they could that that they could save a lot more lives um and that was kind of the argument that that the cop character and I think his name was Cero, uh had with Tony Stark. And then you find out at the end that uh, that Iron Man had given uh, Cero a, uh, a a a phone a phone number. Call this number if you if you need help. And uh, you know if it's a life or death situation, I'll stop what I'm doing. And come help you. So that's what happens is in the middle of this uh, of this battle with with Red Ronan, who they never actually show. So you really kind of had to do your research if you wanted to find out <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> who the heck they were actually fighting. Um, the the Iron Man stops what he's doing and he flies in and he saves uh, he saves the guy that's dying, and then and then takes him away. So that was kind of basically the whole thing where you realize that. Um, the heroes realize how important the first responders are and, you know, and what a privilege it is for, for them who fight all the time and they do it for nothing and they do it without armor and they do it without superpowers. Um, 
and that's kind of the message for for this book is really kind of a love letter to this first responders. Um, so I, I mean, I thought that this book, was, you know, uh, well before we started talking about it, I was gonna say I was kind of a bit of a stretch, you know, to kind of like this book, but I actually think it's a flame on. The the more I just talk myself into it. So, <laughs> you t uh, tell me what you thought about it, Lucas. You actually took every, all the words out of my mouth, man. Freaking, this is absolutely a love letter to first responders, right? Um, the stuff that they had to go through. You know, while the superheroes they're flying out and about in the freaking air, everything throw punches. There's stuff happening on the ground that has to be taken care of, right? Stuff the infrastructure is crumbling. Buildings are falling around normal people. They can't out. You can't. I mean, we saw from the footage from 9-11, you can't just outrun a falling building, right? You got to get right. somewhere. And um, what what hits me and it kind of stirs me up is because I'm a big logistics guy, right? I, you Details, details, details. What are the citizens of New York doing while all these superheroes are doing? What do they What do they got? Well, they got these little uh, bunkers, these little tactical bunkers that they had to hide in while everything was going on. Um, the police are doing their best. They're trying to block off streets. They're they're freaking they're freaking trying to communicate with each other and get people to safety. Um, well, the paramedics would normally if we can come in, if we can help people out, well, guess what? The buildings just fell on top of some of the, the, the paramedical vehicles. Um, some of the cop cars are freaking down because streets are blocked up. There's no help coming. It's little details like that, um, that, that freaking got to me. Um, and it shows me that right now we still have a long way to go in our own society when it comes to all this stuff um between carrie uh which was the name of the female and jay gerald who they made a point of making sure that everybody knew that he was native american so i don't know if we're going to see him later probably not um just the little stuff that they, they brought in you know just cops being cops hanging around at the bar and freaking shouting off at the mouth like yeah man freaking we we crushed it today man but if it wasn't for those those jack balls freaking superheroes we would get the credit that we that we rightly deserve and then it's like okay and then just the you were talking about the the one patient the guy that was on death's door you know like, okay even if you know everybody gets into the little bunkers and everything guess what you still got to triage everybody you got to make sure that everybody's not not hurt you know um that that type of detail of it feels like they actually went to some of the 9-11 stories or some of the, the disaster stories to say, hey, what are the what is the actual stuff that people are going to run into and how would the people or if you had unlimited funds, how would they be able to you know com combat it or if we can at least try to survive at least another hour, at least another day? Not only that, they went into Carrie's problems, right? She's just looking for a place to live. But every time she finds a place to live, the fucking building blows up because of some bad villain freaking doing some stupid stuff. So that kind of hit me kind of hard. Like, man, got you, freaking. You guys are doing freaking great. Um, and if they can keep doing that with some Marvel snapshots, I'm definitely going to keep paying attention. I don't think they're going to do it. They're going to just go back and do, hey, superhero did this. I, I don't care about this. Show me this. Show me the, the people in New York and how they're surviving. Show me the super show me the superheroes and their connections to the people. It's it's this little stuff, this little details that freaking freaking makes me want to read this stuff. Uh, so yeah, definitely a flame on for me. Yeah, I I think this goes further to um to show that Marvel has always really been the world outside your window, right? That's what Stan Lee wanted it to be you know, 60 years ago. And I think that, um, that these books kind of show more than anything else, the, the world outside your window, right? Where they actually, the outside of your window is the superheroes. You're not reading about them. They're kind of being affected by their actions. And that, uh, that to me is that, that gives these, these books relevance to me. So, um, I loved, the Marvel books from 25 years ago. Cause I, no one had ever done anything like that before. Um, and, uh, and these, these are kind of trying to capture the feel of it. And I do think that they're largely hit or miss, but I think this one actually hit the stride. 
Yeah. I I do wonder if they did it on purpose. You know, you were talking about the anachronistic freaking sweat shoot, uh, sweat. Oh, what is it? What do you call it? It's not the, uh, the eighties freaking worked out freaking gear that she's got. She's <laughs> right. running. She's not working out. She's just walking around in freaking town with, with that stuff on in, in middle of New York. Um, but then, and also there's another panel where there's a guy in a zoot suit from like the fifties and then right beside him, there's a, Af there's an African American lady with an Afro, which is a thing from the seventies. So I don't know what they were going with there. Yeah. Um, but Hey, God bless them. You know? <laughs> I think they don't, they don't know what era they were shooting for. So, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's good. I, 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 I didn't. I didn't think I was going to flame on this book, but I did. I used, <laughs> you know, I talked myself into it. So, all right. So let's jump over to uh, Captain America number twenty-five. We'll do like a quick little honorable mention of that book, and uh, and then we we'll wrap it up for the day. So, so yeah, take it away. Tell me what happened in Captain America number twenty-five. Not a lot, not a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> kept, uh, so uh, Captain America, lettered by VCs Joe Caramanga. I thought that was interesting that they put that right up front. Um, you know, written by Tanishi Coates, um, who, once again, I I don't always like his writing. It, it's it's some sometimes he he's a little heavy handed, and sometimes I just have no idea where he's where he's going with stuff. Uh, Leonard Kirk is part of this book. Matt Miller um, had a bunch of different variant covers that really weren't needed, but hey, it is what it is, right? Um, in this book, you know, it's mostly a highlight of what's what's going through uh, Shannon right right now um she's got this new suit that was kind of like a mix of a captain america thing with the iron man suit and everything and she's going around busting bad guys she's been sent on a mission to rescue um some people that have been kidnapped by the red skull and and these other folks and she sends first sends in falcon as kind of a distraction but she's ultimately the person that we can save the day um and that's kind of it, except for the second half of the story, goes back into her past and kind of highlights this other woman. Her name is Alex uh, Cunyon, I believe her last name was, um, and how big of a, a thing she was in her life. But now this Alexa Cunyon, she's kind of a bad person, right? Um, she was the one that made Shannon say, hey, you, you've you got some, some spirit in your kid. Why don't you freaking go over here and freaking do that? And that's where, that's where Shannon got that fire from. Um, but now the person that was our mentor is now a bad person. Um, so I'm not sure what the messages were. It was kind of interesting. Not sure what the messages were, but hey, here we are now. They better do some, something with it. Don't we can go, oh, well, hey, this is who she is. And if we can go off into the sunset, I would be really pissed. Um, I, I'm already pissed enough that they made Shannon Young again. Or is it Shannon or Sharon? I think it's Shannon. Sharon, right? It's Sharon. Sharon, great. Right. I'm already pissed at me. Sharon Young again. They didn't need that. Hey, let old ladies be old ladies, right? Or or bring a bring out another character to do this whole thing. You didn't need to do all that, right? Um, I like the 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 design of the the suit. That's that's fine and everything, but it is what it is. It's it's setting up something. I hope. Um, but the main interesting thing was um the second half of this book, right? Um, uh, you got Captain America going to a funeral of a friend. Um, and this friend was, he met maybe like 30, 40 years ago as a first time immigrant. He just got to this country and Captain America, he's tired, beat, and he comes in. Right, yeah, he come, after, right after he was out of suspended animation too. Yeah. So um, he was and, very much a fish out of water. Exactly. And, uh, He's, he's like, hey, man, I just need a sandwich. And the sa I sees that he's Captain America because it's got it under his trench coat. He's like, yep, whatever you want, and you get it for free. And they, they bond over the fact that the world that they're living in is totally different from the world that they were brought up in. right? So they show that Captain America continuously goes back to talk to this guy. And there's this nice friendship or bond up over l living in different worlds than you're used to and just trying to make it a little bit better at a time. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful story. This is the Captain America that I wanted, right? This is the Captain America that says, hey, the, the America that we are has so much potential. It's not perfect.
perfect. And some of the best things that we have is that immigrants or whatever can come over here and they can try and if they work hard enough, they can build a life for themselves and for their children. And that's the Captain America I've been waiting for and longing for. Other than this other freaking secret warrior stupid stuff, I didn't need all that. So Tanisha Coates finally, hey, finally hits on a story that I think is within his realm. And this, this is the type of stuff that I wanted him to be writing as ca- when he's writing this Captain America stuff. Um, the the Sharon story I didn't need. This is the story. This is the story that that I wanted. Um, I don't know how this hit for you, Professor, but I, but I'm going to flame on this story. You're talking the second story, right? Uh, yes, sir. I don't think I don't know if Coates wrote the second story. Anthony Falcone wrote, wrote the second story. So right, did I get to trash Tanisha Coates again? All right, yeah. awesome. Um, so yeah, if we want to touch on the first uh, the first half of the book, um, this is a kind of a uh, continuation of the storyline of uh, uh, of what's been going on with um with the Carters and, and cap um, the, the thing that I think the, and the one thing that I think would be what I would call Coates out for, cause I overall, I've really enjoyed his run on Captain America. Um, but if you're going to write Peggy and Sharon, you kind of really got to know what's going on with the two of them, because when they first appeared, uh, you know, Peggy first appeared, what back in the 40s um, but Sharon first appeared in uh, Tales of Suspense as Agent 13 um, for S.H.I.E.L.D. but at the time back in the 60s and 70s Peggy and Sharon were actually sisters not niece and aunt really yeah wow. and so uh, you know of course the with the passage of time, right. They had to retcon the crap out of everything. And so now that now they're, they're niece and aunt. And so, yeah, the, over, I think la- it was last issue that or a few issues ago, Sharon had uh, got de-aged again. So she's no, she's no longer old. She's back to her young self. Um, but Peggy also looks really young. And I don't know if they've really kind of explained that, because you know Peggy was active with Cap in World War II, and now she's she's here. And um, if you read this book towards the end of the book, Peggy's the one that falls off the helicopter at the last panel, but she looks like Black Widow. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, That's I had to read reason, it. Right, I had to read it twice. I had to say, "Is that Peggy?" Or because I because at first I was like. Where the heck did Black Widow come from? She hasn't been in this entire book. And then the the last page, I was like, "Oh wait a second, that's Peggy." Um, but that to me, that's kind of a bit confusing, right? right. Um, for confusing to the reader. I mean, if you had just picked this book up, um, that you know, you wouldn't, you would never know. Um, and I read this book every month, and I don't, <laughs> you know, I was like, I thought that was Black Widow, um, but. Concentrating on the the second part of the story by uh, by Anthony Falcone and um, what was throw the artist out there too. So art by uh, Michael Cho. Um, yeah, that second story is man. That's why you buy Cap, right? Because Captain America is not. I mean, it's not a flag that that he he wears the flag, but he's not the flag. He is the spirit of America. And he is the one, you know, and the first person that I think ever wrote uh, Captain America like this is uh, was Steve Englehart and then um, Grunewald, who really um, were Captain Steve Rogers stopped hiding behind the or stopped acting like he was like a government mouthpiece and started saying, you know, hey, you know, even though I wear this flag, I, I don't represent the government, I represent you, the people, right? And that, Mm -hmm. that is where uh, cap has changed over time. And over the years where America has had more of a focus on diversity and everything. And if you remember, um, I don't know if you'll remember, but when Engelhart started writing cap and back in the seventies, his, one of the first stories he wrote was um, he brought the fifties Captain America back (laughs) And we realized that that was two different characters, 
but the Captain America from the 50s had the 50s ideals and mentality of the people of that time, where it was very like a racist, racially motivated character. Mm. And, and, you know, of course, by those stretches was the bad guy in that story. And um, to me, was it was really kind of shocking to kind of compare and contrast um, the, the the different Captain Americas. You can look at it. We would, and we just reviewed uh, U.S. Agent a couple of weeks ago, right? right. So mm-hmm. we talk about Johnny Walker because Johnny Walker used to be a Captain America too. You know, yeah. and he was the government mouthpiece. So you see where you can put, you can dress these characters up and say that they're representing your, you, they're representing you and your country. Um, but the spirit of it isn't the same. So when you, when you look and you're talking to Steve Rogers and you look at this character and, and see this story, even though it's a, what, it's a, like five pages, it's a five page story that hit you so hard over you know immigration and representation and uh, there's this one panel that he's he's talking to the crowd and you're just looking out in the crowd and there's you see muslims you see black you see white you see asian you see just everybody like a like a melting pot of society which is what he's what captain america steve rogers should be representing and that is what uh, what to me, and I think that it's, that's probably the same for you, is what was important for the story. Right. And exactly. it, it, what, what amazed me was Anthony Falcone did, I think, in five pages, what Tina Hasey Coates has, could not do in 25 <laughs> issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. This is the story of Captain America that I was been waiting for. Right, five panels, boom. Yeah, that, that, that's all. That's well, not, excuse me, not five panels, five pages, boom. That was it. This is every single issue of Captain America. There's so many stories where you could capture the spirit of America, and you could do that in every freaking week. And I know, and I would be glad to pick this up. But this is the only issue so far that's actually done it. I mean, there was this. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I, there was one maybe about two years ago, and I forgot who wrote it. Um, and it was like different stories. I think it was actually in the Marvel Presents, maybe number one or number two, where he actually went up against the KKK, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that was a great story because because the question always was, if Captain America was so great, how come he didn't freaking go up against this? Well. That story show, well, he tried to, and it ended up being bad for the people that he tried to help. That was a great freaking story. I, I like that one. And then after that, I was like, okay, let's see more, what more. And then they didn't do anything up until this story. Um, so all I'm saying is that I wish Marvel would do more of this with Captain America. Um, and I would love to see it. it otherwise, these stuff, the stuff by Kate, I, I don't know what, what direction he's going, going with. And Maybe he's trying to do the whole female empowerment thing. Well, the uh, these uh, daughters of do. the the is it the daughters of daughters liberty? Of liberty. Right. Yeah, that they've they've been around for well, according to this story, they've been around forever. But they have really only been around for the last several months in Captain America. So, um, but it seems it seems like every every strong superhero woman in Marvel is a member of this group. <laughs> so, you know, we'll see. It's interesting, but I, I want to say, so the, the, the first half of this story may be a bit of a stretch for me, but the definite flame on for the, for the five pager in the back. Right. Exactly. So, so. mixed, mixed, <laughs> mixed, terrible. I mean, are the five pages is worth your three ninety nine? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think that five pager is worth the three ninety nine. But um, hey, t- so this is just kind of hitting me. How many how many covers does Alex Ross do a month? All of them. <laughs> he does all. Of them. He's <laughs> he's so I so here's what happened. Uh, the speculator market we started souring on Alex Alex Ross because it was just too normal and it was just like eh whatever. Then all of a sudden. All of a sudden, he comes out of nowhere, and he's on a freaking – on a tear. His stuff is just so beautiful now. Hmm. Um, at the at the back of this book, there was a preview for the 
one that's coming out uh, for the next Captain America number 26, which is uh, Captain America fighting Red Hulk. And it's absolutely beautiful, gorgeous. Uh, yeah. there's, there's a, a Hulk, a uh, Mortal Hulk that's coming out um, in, couple, I think, like two months or something like that. Um, that one's freaking gorgeous as well. And it's like the Hulk fighting the thing. And they're just sitting down in a cafe freaking drinking some coffee. Mm-hmm. Very Norman Rockwellish, and that's that's what I wanted to. This, the, these this, for instance, like this this uh this action joint right here, it's okay, it's okay. But he's got some other covers that are absolutely gorgeous. That is like the old Alice Ross that I was that, that I love. The um, and I follow I follow Alex Ross on Facebook, and you should too. Uh, but he posts he posts all those covers and everything like before they ever come out, and uh, like. I just I am in in awe of how how like prolific he's been over the past couple of years, but how fast he's working now. Because uh, I I remember it was a, like a privilege to see an Alex Ross piece, mm. um, and it and they would trickle out. Because I mean those those covers can't that they, they must take days and days and days to do, but to see the just the amount of work he's doing. Uh, you know, he must not be doing anything else to be to be certain. So, well, you know, we are kind of in a quarantine, so <laughs> that's just, just true. That's true. So, but anyway, yeah, I, I, I over the last few years, I've seen him. I've seen more work produced out of him than any time in the last th- thirty years. So, I think he's gonna. You know, I don't want to call him. I, I you called him the Norman Rockwell, Norman Rockwell of comic books, um, because I kind of almost want to compare him to Kirby a little bit for his distinctness of work. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, he's, he is so uh, unique right now. He's, yeah. but he's, he's unique in, uh, in the industry. There's nobody like him. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's interesting. Right. So anyway, uh, so that's going to do it for this episode of no price podcast. Uh, <laughs> well, tune in to a week or two. We got two more episodes left for the year. Holy crap. Wow. Uh, and then we'll be going on to season five. So <laughs> interesting stuff. So, all right. So uh, be here in a couple of weeks. And until then, stay safe. I know COVID's spiking again. So just, uh, you know, stay home, stay safe, read comics.